in tonight's lesson, I want to jump through to a slide. And we're going to pick up with this. We're going to pick up at this verse. But before I do that, now I'm going to kind of just generalize and bring us up to what we covered so far. What I've been trying to emphasize is the necessity of us incorporating our flesh in our walk. If you try to live an inner life for God without incorporating your flesh, it is not going to work. And this is, a lot of this is due to a misunderstanding of how badly we have viewed our flesh because in our flesh is a lower nature or a sin nature that was something that happened to us when we sinned. When we sinned, we developed a taste for the ungodly things of this world. We were tempted, we fell, and then we have a sin nature. So that dwells within us. But we've been looking and we've seen that the body is extremely important in the will of God being done. And this is what I just want to refresh us without reading all those things I put on the slide. And that is this, that until Adam and Eve participated with the temptations of the devil in their flesh, there was not a fall. In other words, the devil said, you can be wise if you eat of that. God hadn't told you the truth. Uh, you'll be like God. That'll taste good. And Eve was thinking about this and she's like, wow. But they had not sinned because they were wrestling with the thoughts about this. It wasn't until they then put, as James calls it, corresponding action or works to their faith or their trust. It wasn't until their flesh reached out their hands, took the apple and ate of it, that's when the fall happened. So there's a, 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 a working of temptation that the evil one does within us but it's when our flesh, it's when we advance and incorporate our flesh and put a corresponding action to the thoughts that are going on, that's when something is birthed. Due to our misunderstanding and now our view, the negative view of the flesh, that it's, it's always this awful thing, we put no focus on it, yet the Word of God is clear that just for example, the Bible says this. It says, do not let sin reign. Paul said this in Romans. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies any longer now that you belong to the Lord. Well, he's talking about our flesh. He's saying, hey, that was the way you are, but it's not the way you are now, or it's not the way you have to be. That's the issue. You can be that way, but it's not the way you have to be. As a matter of fact, Paul said, I keep my flesh under, I buffet my flesh, I beat my flesh to keep it under. Meaning that is a new possibility since you've been born again, since you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, though you still have that nature in this flesh, that's why this flesh must die, then be raised anew, just like Jesus died and then was raised anew. He died corruptible, not corrupted, but corruptible, and he raised incorruptible. And then we looked and saw that our redemption was very tied up in Jesus' flesh. Not just, oh yes, he was the son of God, and therefore that's how we're redeemed. He was the, and is the son of God, but his flesh, he had to live a sinless life in the flesh. He had to humble himself and come in the flesh. It says, though he was equal with God, he did not consider it robbery to take the form of a man humbling himself. So he humbled himself and took on flesh, lived a sinless life, then was beaten in the flesh so that we can be healed, and then was crucified in the flesh 
in a body, his body, he died, and then he rose in the flesh. But he died corruptible, not corrupted, but corruptible, rose incorruptible. If Jesus had not had a flesh body, our redemption would not have happened. So then we begin to see, wait, this flesh is very important, and that's why God is going to raise it. We're actually going to get these flesh bodies back, but they're going to be raised incorruptible. Because he said our bodies are going to be sown one way, and then they are going to be raised. Not a brand new one from somewhere else, from Mars or something. No, this body, my body is going to be raised incorruptible. So I'm looking forward to this body being raised incorruptible. So that says to me, when God said very good in the garden that he created Adam, though Adam was corruptible, he still said very good. This is very good. And when Jesus came in the flesh, the word who was with God and was God became flesh, God then spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When was he pleased? He was pleased when he was there in the flesh. So I'm wanting to really emphasize that because this is a part of our life that we've tended not to keep corralled in, or as I use the example, the broken horse. We've not trained our flesh. We've not learned to keep it under, and it's cost us. That's why the church is in the condition it is today. So we're going to go from there and we're doing this now. We're looking at how to incorporate this with strongholds. Strongholds are in the mind. But I'm wanting now to make sure that we understand in order to deal with strongholds, we're going to have to deal with our minds and our bodies. Romans 12 says, submit your body a living sacrifice. In other words, don't go on the altar and let somebody kill you. No, keep your body alive but submit it as a living sacrifice. That means you're going to sacrifice yourself, your flesh, but you're going to do it in a living fashion. And we were talking, uh, I think last week in a, in a lesson, and we talked about, I think it was in one of Tom's lessons, and we talked about our flesh and that it's easier to die for the Lord than it is to live for the Lord. A living sacrifice is more work than dying a martyr. Now, I'm not saying it's more painful necessarily according to how you die, but it is harder to live for the Lord because you have to pick up your cross daily and keep getting back on it. And so it cost us to keep the flesh under, but it's worth it. It's way worth it. So now in dealing with strongholds, we number one, Romans 12, 1, present your body a living sacrifice. Therefore, your body is part of this renewing your mind, not being conformed to the image of the world, but being conformed to the image of the sun, being transformed. It requires both your body and the renewing of your mind. Now I want to read this verse that I pulled up here. Let me pull the screen over for you. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And this is our emphasis to really understand how to pull down strongholds is not just a mental exercise. So it's mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. And then we've already read the Ephesians verse where it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, and evil spirits. And so what we see is we have an unseen realm of which we wrestle, and their battleground is primarily in our minds, meaning that is the doorway and that is the place where strongholds get built. But strongholds are built with our participation. This is the thing, our participation meaning in our flesh. But let me, let me walk through these slides and see how quickly we can get through these 
four slides. And we basically have covered some of this, so I want to get through it. But strongholds are living thoughts, living thoughts. And if you remember, God's word says, my words, which is God's thoughts, words are carriers of thoughts. My words are living and powerful. So strongholds are living thoughts, meaning spiritual words, spiritual words. That means words from the spirit realm. They are not just words. They're carriers of spiritual thought. Now, there's both good spiritual thought and bad spiritual thought. But bad spiritual thought, this is, this is kind of the thought I want you to get. Bad spiritual thought is the opposite of good spiritual thought. So if good spiritual thought, if God says the way of success is walking in love, that's good spiritual thought. He said those words are living. But if those words are living, and they are because he said his words are living, if those words are living and walking in love is the way, you know, to succeed, then walking not in love is also a spiritual principle. It's the opposite spiritual principle. Surely we're not going to say if you walk in love, you'll be blessed. And if you don't walk in love, you'll still be blessed. No, no. God's saying, no, if I tell you you walk in love, you'll be blessed. I'm also telling you without having to say it, if you don't walk in love, you won't be blessed. And so then there's a other side or what I'll call the negative side of spiritual reality. And that is this, if God promises, if we obey him good, then it goes without saying, if you disobey him, you don't have good reason to expect Good. Therefore, the other side of that is spiritual reality. It's real. Those words are real because those words are carrying principles. They're carrying the mind of God, the way God is. God is not saying this is the way I've chosen to think. God is saying this is the way I am. When I reveal myself, I'm telling you how I am and I do not change. So we need to realize this. Now, going back to our slide for a minute here, strongholds are living thoughts. Strongholds appear to be, I'm saying the way the Word of God talks about them, appear to be well-established patterns of thinking that suggest, direct, and compel us to corresponding action. These strongholds are planted and built in us and they become systems of thought or the way we think and the way we respond and the way we act. And once a stronghold is built with our participation and then we continue to act from that stronghold and a stronghold is just a dominant thought pattern, or I'll call it a worldview because that's what we're going to talk about. It's a worldview. When you have a stronghold, it's the way you see things. It doesn't mean the way you see it is correct, but nonetheless, it's the way you see things. And because that's the way you believe, it's the way you see things. It's the way you think things work. Because of that, it then will cause you to have a particular type of corresponding action. And when you have that particular type of corresponding action, you actually give life to what you believe things are in your life. When we're hearing thoughts and we believe them and we act upon them, those were not arbitrary thoughts. So when I say, well, if I believe even a lie, If I believe a lie and I act on it, it can become a reality. That's not because I'm making my own reality. It's because those thoughts did not come from nowhere. They come from a spiritual reality. They're either coming from the enemy's kingdom or God's kingdom. 
Therefore, my believing them does not make something out of nothing. My believing them gives life to the realm that I'm listening to. My believing them gives life to the realm I'm listening to. God's realm, he said, my words are living. If you believe them, like Romans 1, 16, if you believe the gospel, it has the power to save you. If you do not believe the gospel, it does not have the power to save you. But my believing the gospel or not believing the gospel doesn't make the gospel true. The gospel is true whether I believe it or not. But my believing and then corresponding action to the gospel has everything to do with whether it works in my life, whether it saves me. The gospel, the good news is the power of God unto salvation unto those who believe. So my believing then becomes or my corresponding action or my responsibility to respond ability to respond to what God is saying then, I then have a role to play in this. And this is what I'm saying, but it's my role is not only to acknowledge that it's true, but then to incorporate my life in a corresponding way to what I say I believe. When I do that, what I believe then begins to live in me. So I'm, I'm hoping I didn't cover too much territory there, but that's, this is where I'm wanting us to see our belief in corresponding action is extremely important. So now let's go to this second one. Strongholds without your participation can do nothing. And this again is going to that thing of in James where faith without works is dead. Trust without corresponding action dies. This is both for the good kingdom and the bad kingdom. This is both for the secrets, the mysteries, the mysterions of the kingdom, which Jesus has said it's been granted unto us to know, and the mysterion of iniquity, which is at work. The word of God says it's already at work. And so I'm wanting again to stress to us that what we believe about what we hear and then how we act based on what we believe, makes all the difference in the world what type of strongholds you have. Now, strongholds, not all strongholds are bad. Actually, in one of the verses in the Old Testament, God is called our stronghold. He is our stronghold. But the question is, is he your stronghold? Or do you say, I believe in God, but my corresponding actions and belief are in this direction? but I do believe there's a God out there. I do believe there's a God and Father of the Lord Jesus. Well, James says, well, even the demons believe that. Our belief is not simply something we acknowledge is possibly true and likely true. That is not belief. Belief is when you believe something enough that it now causes a particular type of actions through your flesh, in your life. This is the missing element in Christianity today. Many people will say, oh, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that. And then I say to them, do you live that? And they're like, no, nobody lives the stuff. Are you kidding? We can't live that. We're just people. Well, I'm like, well, wait, what are you saying then? And so what they're saying to me is no, we have other strongholds that work in our lives too. So that, and those will allow us, they allow us to acknowledge there's a God that's spoken of in the Bible. That those uh, other strongholds allow us to acknowledge that God has a son, his name is Jesus. He died on the cross and rose from the dead. But the strongholds that we walk under that we believe and trust and corresponding our actions to that, they do not allow us to walk in these things. Golly, we're just people. That's a stronghold. We're just people. 
Yeah, we're just people. Hello, go look in the mirror. No, the mirror is a liar. But you've been taught to believe the mirror. Paul said, why do you walk as mere men? Well, because we believe we're mere men. That's a stronghold. And this is what I'm saying. The strongholds that you believe and live out, that is what you believe. Acknowledging other things to be true doesn't mean that you believe them. I'm saying biblically believe them. What I believe and what I confess and what I walk out, that is what I believe. And so as we're looking to deal with strongholds, we're gonna, and we got to be honest with ourselves, folks, we have to acknowledge, why do I do some of the things I do? As I called it, the Roman 7 life. I find myself doing things I don't want to do. The things I do want to do, I don't do. Why? Why am I doing this? I'm a new creation. I've been born again. I have the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. Why am I still doing that? Because I've not dealt with strongholds. I've not dealt with the ways of thinking that govern the way I live. Not what I say at a church service. Not what I say to another believer. Oh, it doesn't govern that. Oh, do you believe in the gifts of the Spirit? Yeah. Do you believe God does miracles today? Yeah. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. Really? You believe God heals today? Yeah, 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 yeah. I believe all that stuff. You do? How many people do you pray for to get healed? None. Because I'm just, up. Oh, there it is. That's your stronghold. There it is. You serve it. So you acknowledge the other is real, but you serve that one. Your corresponding actions and what you profess is really what you believe. I'm just a regular person. Golly, what am I going to do? Now, I'm saying these things this way so that we can begin to say, wait, I need to reevaluate what I say I believe because what I say I believe in a certain circumstance and what I live out, they're not matching. And so the question is, one, which one's the real you? The real you is the one you do. That's the real you. Now, I'm saying this, if we're going to pull down those strongholds, then the real me has got to not only acknowledge what is true, and we do have to acknowledge what is true. We have to confess and profess who Jesus is. Amen. But then we have to cross a line and say, well, if I'm really saying I believe this, I think the Word of God is telling me my corresponding actions should line up with what I say I believe. Otherwise, James says, if your corresponding actions don't line up with what you say you believe, what you say you believe is a corpse. Means it looks like a person, but when you go over and shake them, you find out they're dead. That, that's not a person. That's a body. There used to be a person inside that body, but now it's just a corpse because it's not living. Now, for us to pull down strongholds, we've got to recognize strongholds at work in us. And we've got to be real. And we got to say, God, um, bottom line is, I just have to admit, I really don't believe you on this. Now, I know we wouldn't want to say something like that because you say, well, what do you think? God lied to you? No, I don't think he lied to me, but I'm just telling you, I don't believe he'd do that for me. Well, then we've got an issue. And so this is what I'm, I'm wanting to get us to this point to where we say, I've got an issue when I can say I believe God, yet I don't believe God. Wait, that also sounds like James, the wave of the sea tossed to and fro, here for a minute, there for a minute. No, I do. No, I don't. Well, 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 well. So the question is, are we to live this life in this earth vacillating, as it says in James, jumping back and forth, never, be, never becoming stabilized and a fruitful believer? 
is, is this just the lot, our lot in life? And I'm saying, no. What we have not recognized is the reason we vacillate is we have strongholds still speaking into our lives. They allow us to say godly things. They allow us to profess certain things, but they don't allow us to do them. Why? Because if you do those things, you now give life to them. The devil doesn't care if you go around saying, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. As long as you're serving him, the devil doesn't care if you say Jesus is Lord. He cares who you're serving. And you know what? God doesn't care if you're saying Jesus is Lord. He cares who you're serving. As Joshua said, choose you this day. What stronghold are you going to serve? Who are you going to serve? You know, when you believe in God, you still believe in the devil. You believe in the existence. I mean, hopefully, a lot of, a lot of believers don't today, but hopefully you believe that there are demons. I believe demons are there. I believe Satan is there. But that's different than serving him. But unfortunately, that's the two-way street with God. I believe there's a God in heaven. I believe he has the Son seated at his right hand. I believe that. But serving him? I don't know. I, you know, that's like getting out there. That's extreme. I mean, like, really? We're supposed to be walking around serving him? Aren't we just supposed to say, well, we're believers. We believe he died on the cross. Just pray this simple prayer. Yep, I believe he, amen, there you go. You're all done. And I'm saying, uh-uh, uh-uh. God's saying, who are you serving? Who told you it's okay to profess and confess that I'm Lord? Because even Jesus said this. He said, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? And we'll say, well, Lord, who said we have to do what you say? All we have to do is acknowledge you're, you're the Son of God who came, lived, died on the cross, rose from the dead. I believe in my heart, say with my mouth, I'm set. He's like, uh, uh. You have been taught from people with strongholds and they've slowly migrated believers into a way wrong mindset to where we now accept strongholds. We accept wrong thinking and wrong action because we default back to, but I prayed the prayer. So this is what I'm, I'm trying to oppose and I'm telling you, your body has to be on board. Now, I am not talking about perfection. In this life, we will not be perfect, meaning without a fall or a flaw. That's not what I'm talking about. But God is saying, I do look for you to be faithful. And faithful means if you do fall, a righteous man falls seven times and gets up again. That means he repents. He turns back and says, I'm still after it, God. I'm still after it. But see, when strongholds get in, they start convincing us, hey, we're just people. Hello, nobody's perfect. Are you perfect? I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Are you perfect? What does that have to do with the truth? What I am. And so what they're saying is that's a stronghold speaking. That's a stronghold talking. So this is what I'm wanting to, to really emphasize and get to our strongholds now. I'm going to read one other uh, or two other verses, and then we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6. Now, one of the things that I want you to realize that is possible, and I know generally speaking, I could say this, and you say, oh, I believe that's possible. But I want you to really believe this is possible. And that is this slide right here. This is God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. And the first one is Jeremiah 28, 15, and then Jeremiah 29, 31. Jeremiah 28, 15, and then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make this people trust. Now the word trust here could just as easily be have faith. And so you make this people trust in a lie. 
Now look at Jeremiah 29, 31. Send to all of those in captivity. So now he's talking to the people. There he was talking to a prophet who was helping the people to trust in a lie. Now he's talking to the people. Send to all of those in captivity. Notice the word captivity because I'm using this to point to believers who live in captivity. Send to all of those in captivity, all believers who live in captivity, saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shimei, the Nehelamite, because Shimei has prophesied to you, and I have not sent him. And he has caused you to trust in a lie. Here's what I want you to know, believers. Now, these were God's people, and they were unfortunately hearing from people that they respected as people who spoke the word of God. But these people spoke something that wasn't from God, and the people believed a lie. They put their trust in a lie. Here's what I want you to know because you're not going to be able to pull down strongholds in your life until you realize I could be believing a lie. I could genuinely believe a lie. I could be believing a lie and living a corresponding life to the lie because I believe the lie is true. And I believe I'm doing the right thing, but I could be wrong because it is possible for believers to believe a lie. Now, this is a huge revelation, but I'm just telling you, it is possible for believers to believe a lie. Now, unless you go into this with that possibility in mind, then you're going to have a hard time for allowing God to identify to you strongholds in your life because all of us, or hopefully, <laughs> all of us believe what we believe is true. That's why we believe it. But it is possible that there's something that I believe to be true that's a lie. And these usually come to us at points in our life, generally earlier when we're more vulnerable to what someone says from an authority position, which is what God dealt with them, and someone says, and it gets planted in our minds, in our thoughts. Now, I'm going to tell you a, a quick stronghold that got planted in my, my mind when I was in Bible school because I so admired the primary teacher and founder of the school. And I'm not picking on him, so I won't say his name. But I so admired him that it was hard for me to believe that he would say anything that was not true. So I was like, I was like a, a, a fish in water just saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, and anything you say, I believe, which is an unbiblical way to listen to a teacher, including me. You need to search the scripture and see if the things that I'm saying are so. So this particular teacher said, now, when you're living by faith or walking by faith, if you're in faith and you don't have your answer, whatever it is you're believing God for, within two weeks, then you're not in faith. Because he was such a powerful figure to me, in my mind, just like Jeremiah is saying that these false prophets, those people saw them as prophets, but they didn't speak what the Lord said. And so when this teacher said, if you don't have in two weeks what you're asking for, then you are not in faith. You're in unbelief. Well, when he said that, I was like, golly, something's wrong with me. I've never gotten anything in two weeks. I don't even know if I've gotten anything in two years. So now how do I get out of this unbelief? Because I can't get anything to work in two weeks. And that became a stronghold because I received it from him as the gospel. And I began to live by that standard of trying to get my prayers answered within two weeks or start repenting for being in unbelief. But that was not God what he said. 
And later I heard him teach and he talked about being in a battle that took him like a year and year and a couple of months to get the victory. And, you know, he said, oh, he was talking about how to, anyway, how to fight the fight of faith. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. I have been living in bondage all this time to the two-week principle that if I can't get it in two weeks, then something's wrong and I'm in unbelief. But the truth is, it wasn't his fault. Now, he shouldn't have said that. That was a wrong statement. I'm just saying there's no biblical precedent for saying you got two weeks to get what you're praying for. But nonetheless, I'm saying that thing got planted in me. And, and it constantly kept me in a state of repenting. Lord, I don't know what's wrong. How come I can't get my prayers answered? How come stuff's not working? All this stuff. And it was a lie. Now, I'm not saying he said it as a malicious lie. I'm saying he, it was a lie. Oh, so, but that is because it became a stronghold. But then here's how I fortified the stronghold is when I was praying for something and didn't get it in two weeks, I start repenting. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. I'm in unbelief. I don't know what's going on. Lord, forgive me. I'm in unbelief. And you know what the evil one's saying? Oh, he is building that strongholds. Put another brick in there, buddy. Keep doing it. Be, and you say, well, how are you building strongholds when, when you're repenting? Because you're repenting for something that's not real. So I'm wanting us to see how strongholds work. That, and that's why they're hard to identify sometimes because I believe that to be true because I believe that man of God and he was a man of God. He's with the Lord now. Amen. But he was a man of God. This is not against his character. It was just, that was just an unbiblical statement. But I received it and then I began to practice repenting when I did not get my answers. And so every time I was repenting, the devil says, he still believes that. Look, he still believes it. Look, he's putting another brick in. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I'm, I, I could have probably built, I probably built a tower as big as the Tower of Babel from the repenting of not being able to, to master the two-week window. And I still have never mastered the two-week window. <laughs> I don't know what all God, God's done. But I'm saying that to say that strongholds, see, they, they begin to govern. And strongholds, we tend to want to think these are only evil, wicked thoughts, although they can be evil, wicked thoughts, but they're crafty. The evil one is crafty. And you know what he does? He, he's attacking our faith, our growth with God, just like he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. Has God said, you know what? God's holding out on you. God's holding out on you. And so what he was attacking was my faith. And he had me in a, in a cycle. And I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't gonna hurt the devil in the cycle and I wasn't hurting God, I, I, but God just saw me. I was running around in circles. And so this is why I want us to begin to recognize not only do we need to incorporate in our lifestyle, but there's some things that are, are incorporated in our lifestyle that we need to bring out or we need to change. Now, what I want to do is I'm just going to leave that slide up. Uh, the one about Jeremiah, it's, it's irrelevant now. And I want to read out of Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start in verse 22. And we were going to go to 22 to 34, but I can already see we're not going to get to 34. So if you're, I don't know what version you have, but mine is broken into 22, 23 with a title heading, then 24, title heading, then 25 through 34, title heading. So right now, we'll just start with this, the one that's called the lamp of the body, the lamp of the body. Now, I want to read this, and this is probably as far as we're going to get on this. But the lamp of the body. Now, here's what it says, verse 22, Matthew 6, 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. Now, we're going to kind of break this down. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Now, naturally speaking, that doesn't make any sense. But your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, therefore, the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? 
Now, before we break this down, I want you to know that even though these verses have those headings and they break them up as separate things, actually 22 through 34 all go together. So, but we're not going to be able to get through those tonight, although I thought I was going to. I'm always ambitious and, and see more than I'm able to say. But I want us to know that those verses go together, so it would probably be worth your reading 22 through 34 and that we see these hooked together. So now let's go back and kind of break this down. And I'm going to call the lamp of the body being the eye as we're going to put this term in there, biblical world view. Biblical world view. Now, a world view is the way in which you see the world. But I don't mean with these eyes only. It's the way you perceive this world. It's the way you think things work in this world. And the way you think what you think the whys and the hows of this world. This is where I'm saying what he's saying right here. And I'm going to put this word in there. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore, and I'm going to put this in where the word the eye is. The lamp of the body is your worldview. Therefore, if your worldview is biblical, your whole body will be full of light or your whole life will be full of light. But if your worldview is bad, meaning wrong, misconstrued, not necessarily like you only see ugly. No, I see good, but it's still, I don't see correctly. So now listen to this. But if your worldview is bad, your whole body or your whole life will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, what Jesus is saying here is if you have thinking, or we're going to say strongholds, if you have thinking or strongholds that are so implanted in you and you believe they're right and they're really wrong, He's saying, I want you to know those are going to be powerful in your life. If you believe something to be in the biblical standard of right, but it's actually unbiblical, it can be very potent against you. Again, to refer back to the when my favorite teacher at that time said, if you do not have your prayer answered in two weeks, then you're in unbelief. That was an unbiblical view. Now, when I then began to look at the world and I saw problems, I saw, oh, those people are in unbelief. Oh, that family over there, they're battling a particular sickness, but they didn't get their answer in two weeks. They are in unbelief. Well, wait, no, no, you're, you, you may be misreading that. Just like Job, his buddies misread his circumstances. And they began to say, Job, Job, you're doing something wrong, brother. You're in unbelief. Because if you weren't in unbelief, you'd have an answer in two weeks. And so what I'm saying is, I want us to see what Jesus is saying is wrong thinking and allowing strongholds to stay in your life that are not biblically supportable. And you say, yeah, but I kind of feel this is the right thing. You must go to biblical support. You must find, you must examine your thinking in light of the Word of God. Now, I wrote down a couple of things in, in view of this to kind of help us understand what I'm saying. Your biblical worldview, this is three things, and this is not everything. This is just to kind of help us see what I'm talking about, a biblical worldview. Your biblical worldview is this. A biblical worldview is this. The spirit world is real. There are angels. There are demons. There are clashes in the kingdom. 
They are both battling in the realm of the spirit. There are principalities over nations that withstood Gabriel when he came to speak to Daniel. And then Michael, the archangel, came and helped. This is a reality. And so I'm saying, if you do not believe in this, if you do not believe what the Word of God says about the unseen realm, then I'm telling you, you're going to have a wrong world view. And Jesus is saying, if the light that's in you is actually inaccurate, but you accept it as totally accurate, then you are going to have, and I must say this, strongholds or problems. Or you are going to live as a Romans 7 person, and a Romans 7 person is the person who says, I find myself doing the things I don't want to do, the things I do want to do, I don't do, who will deliver me from this body of death? But then Paul gives us the answer. Become a Romans 8 person. But you can't just jump from a Romans 7 person to a Romans 8 person. Now, that was a believer, the Romans 7 person. You can't just jump from a Romans 7 person to a Romans 8 person and keep darkness in your thinking. You have to change your worldview. You have to make a decision, and then this is, is going to be in the second part, which we're not going to read right now, but this is the second part. You have to make a decision. What this says is true, is true. Whatever this says is true, is true. And if my denomination doesn't accept stuff in here that this says is true, that's their problem. This is true. This is the Word of God. So we have got to reach a place to where we start making decisions because you are not going to examine yourself. Paul said examine yourself whether you're in the faith. You are not going to examine yourself truthfully, accurately, if you do not make the hard decisions that say, this is right even if I don't like what it says. This is the way it is, even if I don't like what this says. This is accurate, even if this is against the way I was raised, it doesn't matter. This is accurate. Now, I'm saying that because this is, goes back to Romans 12. When he says, present your body a living sacrifice, that means once you come to the light of something in Scripture, and you read believers are supposed to be doing this, Guess what you're supposed to be doing? What you read believers are supposed to be doing. And guess what you're supposed to stop doing? What you read believers are supposed to stop doing. Now, I'm just telling you, this is getting to the very practical things. We have strongholds. We find ourselves, we, we dislike, as I told in some of my testimony, I hated what I was. I hated what I did. But me hating what I was and hating what I did didn't stop me. It's not until I make some hard decisions, and that is this. Number one is, I could be wrong on how I see things, but the Word of God is never wrong on the things it says. Never, never, never. Therefore, when I read in the Word of God something that contradicts what I'm comfortable with, what I like, what I prefer, if I read it in there, this is written for me, then I am to now change my thinking about it, and secondly, I'm to now change my actions. And that's the hardest part. We can say, oh, okay, now I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have not been believing correctly. You're right, there you go, you need to repent of that. And you say, okay, now, Lord, I believe correctly. But then after you say that, he's saying, okay, now change your life to live in a corresponding action to what you just told me you believe. And that is not so easy. But when we start doing that, as I told you a while ago, when I kept repenting for something that I was not even wrong, I was building a stronghold. But when we start doing what is right, we start dismantling bad strongholds 
and we take a brick off that tower and move it over to the new tower, the good stronghold that I'm building, because I've now come to understand things that I didn't understand. And I now come to practice things that I never practiced before. And as I'm doing this, I'm beginning to build a new stronghold. I, and, and a stronghold in a good sense is like, as I told before, King David. When King David went to face Goliath, what gave him the courage to do that? His experience with God. God delivered a lion into his hand. It says he grabbed him by the beard and he slew him. Can you imagine grabbing a lion by the beard and slaying him? And he, he also killed a bear. David killed a bear. And so then when David went to Goliath, he said, I, I can kill him. I'm not afraid of him. Oh, David, he's a big warrior. Hey, I killed a lion with my hands. I killed a bear. I can kill him too. And so therefore, you're beginning to build good strongholds. And so as we build the good ones, we're dismantling the bad ones. So we say, ah, no, 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 I used to think I was just a person. You know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You will not find that term in the Bible addressing people who already know the Lord. He doesn't say you're just sinners saved by grace. That's a tradition. That's a stronghold. You're just a sinner. You're just a sinner. I ran into a Baptist guy. He got after me. He was all fired up. And, and he said, you're just a sinner. I'm like, no. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He said, you're a sinner. I said, you just, you are just denying the word of God. I just quoted the word of God to you. But you know what? That's a stronghold. That's a stronghold in his thinking. And I know because I used to be the same way. Well, we're just sinners saved by grace. That sounds humble, but it's degrading to the great glorious work that God has done in us. We're new creations. We've been born from heaven. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And Paul said, why are you living like a mere man going around saying, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. We were sinners and we were saved by grace, but we are new creations now. We are sons of God. And it says all of creation has been subjected to futility, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. And when we're revealed and we're totally, our new bodies and no corruption, you're not going to be saying, well, that's just a bunch of sinners saved by grace. See, those are strongholds. These things run our lives. So we've got to be real honest with ourselves and say, Lord, I want you to show me the strongholds in my life. Now, he's not going to show them all at once to you because he's merciful. <laughs> and we'd all pass out and say, Lord, it's beyond help. But no, he's not going to show us. But what he does is he begins to take the primary ones that are your stumbling block right now. And he will take the word of God. And if you'll read the word of God, he'll say, well, what do you think about that? He'll say, uh, how, how would you apply that? With How come you're doing this over here? And you say, well, Lord, uh, uh, and he's like, okay, we need to deal with that. And so this is what I'm saying. And, and uh, again, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there because I'm wanting to get into another the subject, but I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so go to the Word of God, go to God and say, Lord, show me. Show me the areas that are in my life that may sound religious. They may even sound Christian, but that they're really an unbiblical worldview. I'm viewing this, this life as a son of God in an unbiblical fashion. Help me to see, Lord. And when and we're going to eventually get into the Holy Spirit, and this is an area that, oh, the views on the, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they're like all over the board. But the Bible says things, and what the Bible says is true. And bottom line is, it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> it does matter what you believe. It matters what you believe and do for you, but it doesn't change the truth. Okay, let's pray.